Isha K. Welcome to the Musicians Mobile Show. What's up? Not so much. Thanks for having me. Isha, let's talk about Isha. She started with Musicians Mobile when she was nine years old. She's now 21 years old. She's the founder of Rip Jeans Records, and she just moved to London. And tell me about this degree you're pursuing, or no, I'm sorry, your diploma that you're uh, pursuing in London. So I am currently here to study a songwriting diploma at the London campus of the British and Irish Institute of Modern Music. Um, and it's really cool, like one year in program that kind of walks you through everything songwriting from lyrics to arrangement to production. Um, so it's really just like a great way of kind of diving in and learning about right. all the different aspects. Um, but yeah, I'm excited for it to start. Why London? What, out of all the musical cities, and London is a great one, what made you choose London? I have always, always, always just been so madly in love with this city. Um, I've been coming here since I was a kid, but there's something about it that's always just been like so magical to me. And last year I actually um, was over here and I played a gig here. And that one gig to me like was really eye-opening in terms of like the culture of music mm -hmm. here and how it differs from back home in the Bay Area just because I felt this overwhelming sense of community and just care for the arts. Um, and that really excited me. So I think that was a really, really big indicator that, you know, I needed to be somewhere that fueled me as much as I needed to be to pursue a career in music. That's, that's great. Yeah, the right environment can, can really impact you in your motivation. And it sounds like that's why London has been the choice for you when did you first first start to play let's start there um well i've been surrounded by music ever since like i was very very little when i was just born i was actually born prematurely and even mm. then like i was kept in a little um i don't know what the word is but i was in like incubator in yes incubator <laughs> and you know i had to stay in that for i think a good like month or so oh, wow. um, and even then my dad would always come and stick his finger through the hole and sing oh. to me uh, everything from brian adams boys to men um everything so it's always been a huge part of my life and i think you know i've been in early music classes since as soon as they would let me in but i only really started playing in like a formal instruction setting um when i was maybe about three or four okay. i took piano lessons um from a teacher and originally i was only really learning classical piano right. and i quickly realized that it while it's a great genre and it's you know i have so much respect for classical music and classical musicians it just wasn't for me right and as a result of that i didn't practice um mm -hmm. but i still go to lessons and my teacher didn't like that very much. So she suggested I take a break. And that's what I did. And in that, you know, span of a month or so that I wasn't in piano lessons, I was like, hey, I want to learn guitar. Right. Um, and I've been singing throughout, too. I don't know exactly when I started, like, formal singing lessons, but I've been taking them forever on and off. Um, but I think as I you know, started to become more aware of music. I started to become more aware of like my interest in the more contemporary right. genres. So I think like just about the time that I started learning guitar from Musicians Mobile when I was nine, that's also when I was noticing like, ooh, I like singing songs that are pop rock more than I do like really? classical things. Um, so yeah, Musicians Mobile was such an eye opener, I think, because I was able to get exposed to the types of music that aren't typical of little kids mm -hmm. um, when they usually start off. So it was really, really just such a great opportunity at such a great time. What were you listening to back then that you wanted to learn on uh, guitar? Oh, well, if you talk to Carl, who was my guitar teacher for the longest time, I think like the first thing I asked him was, can I play Taylor Swift? Like right away. I remember your big T-Swizzle fan. 
I was. And I think like for a good four shows in a row, I just played nothing but Taylor Swift songs. Um, yeah. But nothing wrong with that. Yeah, I, I still like Taylor Swift. Yeah, she's cool. But my tastes have definitely evolved a lot. Have you come full circle to Taylor, back to Taylor Swift? Maybe you went through a period where it's like, ah. You know, I actually cool. haven't come back to her yet. I oh, think okay. like at Another this point, years. my taste is way, way, way more into the rock. Right. Yeah, maybe. Maybe. I've gone way more into like the edgier and, um, you know, more gritty stuff, but she's, she's an amazing artist. If you just look at her from a career perspective as well. So definitely a lot of respect for her. What were your hopes back then when you're just first starting with the instrument? What did, what did you want to do or what was your, what was your thought process back then in regards to music? Um, well, I knew I loved it. I, I knew it was like one of the, things in the world that there was nothing that I loved more of. Um, it was just an obsession. And, you know, when I was younger, like I would never want to tell people when they asked me what I wanted to be when I grow up, that I wanted to be a singer because mm. I knew they'd ask me to sing. So I would just say something like marine biologist or something just right. to kind of get off my case. But I think even from then, like I knew – I wanted to do something relating to music and for the longest time I thought it was just performing. But I think as I've kind of grown and had more experiences in the different aspects of the industry, like music business and all that, like I feel pretty confident that, you know, whether I'm able to make a career as a performer or as someone on the industry side, like I know I would be super happy with either. So just keeping all my options open. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's always a good thing. You never know which way things will lead you. What were some of the most challenging aspects of playing an instrument back in those early years? My fingers were not big enough to play like bar chords. <laughs> Blame it and on I the remember, <laughs> Yeah, they were just too small and too weak. And I remember for years, I was just, you know, waiting for the day that I'd wake up and my fingers would be long enough to play an actual bar chord. Um, but I remember that really, really bugging me when I was younger. But I think in terms of like other challenges, kind of learning that embracing your own unique sound mm. is feels a lot more rewarding than trying to mimic someone else's sound. Um, I know wow. that when I was listening to a lot of Taylor Swift, a lot of the stuff I was writing and even a lot of the techniques I'd use when I'd sing were very similar to what she would do. So it wasn't really like I was singing myself. It was more like I was imitating her. Right. And it took a really long time for me to be okay with the fact that my voice is different. And I remember, you know, a vocal teacher of mine pointed out like, hey, you have a really cool like rock edge to your voice right and at the time i was in full-on you know pop mode and I, I was like no ew no i hate that like oh i need to bury it but it's something that i've actually grown to really really embrace because right. i think ultimately what makes my voice different from like another person's voice and that shouldn't be something that you know you try to stifle mm -hmm. um but I think just trying to break that like mental block of, you know, I have to sound like this, or if I want to do well, I have to write in this style. Like that was probably a really big challenge for me, but you know, as with everything does, I think time was the best um, remedy for that. And just kind of singing things and catching myself while doing it and being like, whoa, yeah. I can do that oh, maybe it's not so weird or maybe that's kind of cool. That's such a cool thing to to embrace your own unique voice. Um, a lot of people do try and imitate others, you know, if even beyond music and they don't realize they might have an inherent strength that they were born with, that if they embrace that, it's something that people immediately respond to because it's authentic. Mm -hmm. And if you think about like some of the biggest acts in the world, they're not 
massively successful because they sound exactly like you know right. another singer it's because like they have a completely different sound like think about adele she doesn't sound like anybody else right or think about ed sheeran his style is completely you know his own um right. so i think like i i don't know if it's set in stone but i personally feel like as an artist you're going to feel a lot more happier and content and i think successful if you're doing something that's you mm -hmm. 100% you and not yeah. you know borrowing from other people's talents or techniques or styles it takes a high degree of self awareness uh, how did you develop that um i don't know i really don't know i i do remember though when i was younger Every weekend, I would just spend hours and hours and hours sitting in my little like music room with headphones on and a little like blue snowball mic, just singing to karaoke tracks, every single one I could think of. And I would just be listening to myself sing. And it sounded really cool because it was coming through like a speaker into my head. Right. I think, you know, at the time it was just for fun, but I think through doing that, I was able to be like, oh, okay, this is my voice singing to this track. This is what it would sound like if I sang this song instead of okay. someone else. So I think it's it's hard to listen to yourself, but I think the more you do it, the better you are at kind of looking at yourself and your abilities from a non-biased perspective and just from like a mm -hmm. listener. Right, that's um, tough. Yeah, it's really hard. And even now, like, I still, you know, We'll find things to nitpick. Um, and sometimes there are things to nitpick, but I think you also have to learn that not everyone's going to listen to you and judge you as much as you are. <laughs> right. And some people, well, actually, a lot of people love the imperfections. Yeah. That's what we all can relate to is mm -hmm. sometimes when something is a little out of tune or the voice breaks at a certain point in the song, perfection is who can relate to perfection? Exactly. Like some of my favorite songs and favorite sections of songs are places where, you know, you can hear that an artist is on the verge of breaking down or right. you can hear that if they push themselves any more or, you know, if they go any louder, they'd be completely maxed out. Right. So it's just hearing, you know, exactly what you were saying, hearing those imperfections or hearing those like unscheduled or unplanned mm -hmm in a performance I think makes it so much more real so much more like felt instead of just right. listening yeah because music's about vulnerability don't you think so? Yeah, 100% yeah, that's what opens us up to you know feeling uh, different songs you know what the artist is willing to share with us and you know it's, that's got to be scary though you know, I, I know when I've tried to sing, it's, singing is tough and I don't have a great voice by any means, but when you sing, it's so personal because when you hold a guitar, it's a, it's an instrument, but it's it's separate from you. But when you sing, it's coming out of your, your body and your face and, and your vocal cords. It's so personal. And that's why yeah. it's really tough to put yourself out there as a singer. How do you, you know, overcome that, uh, I don't know, many people might view it as people judging them, everyone's watching you. That's, that's a lot of pressure. How do you overcome that? Um, I don't know. I think, w I know that there have definitely been performances or moments or even like studio sessions where I'll be either tracking vocals or singing a song that, you know, for some reason is hitting a, you know, string for me that day. I, I am thinking specifically to this one day that I was recording the vocals for a song that I put out called Surrender. And it's a song that's like incredibly vulnerable. Right. At least I feel like it's incredibly vulnerable because I was, you know, singing about a particular experience that was hard to talk about and I couldn't talk right. about it, but I felt like I could write about it. Right. And so I remember being in the vocal booth Losing my voice. Ah, not good for a singer. But yeah. I remember being in the vocal booth um, 
like literally on the verge of tears because mm. I really wanted to put everything I had into that song and into that vocal take. And, you know, I knew that there was a producer out there listening. I knew that, you know, the engineer was listening to my vocal take, but I think I just got so lost into it and was feeling it so much that, you know, thinking about what, you know, the producer was thinking or, you know, listening to it at that moment was the last thing on my mind because I was just so in it. All right. Um, and then I remember like when I finished singing and when the take was over, I literally opened my eyes and just took a huge breath because it was like that intense. Um, but it was powerful, you know? It felt like an out-of-body experience. And I think that's a sign that, you know, you're putting everything into it. And some, like I said earlier, some of my favorite pieces of music are songs where you can hear that everything of the artist is into that song. Um, so I think in terms of getting over what other people think, you want them to think. You want them to think like, oh, where is she coming from? Or, oh, wow, she sounds so like, you know, the more that they're thinking about your performance, the more you hook their attention. And isn't ultimately that the goal for every song or performance or artist? Wow. You're dropping some gems right there. <laughs> that takes it's a like, lot of courage, though. How, where's the courage come from? Uh, I don't know. I really don't know. I think with me, I feel like every music or every song that I've put out there is me. Mm -hmm. um and i want people to know me for me and i i don't know that's just something that i've always kind of rolled with and i know that you know if i put on you know if i put on an act right it's not gonna it's not gonna feel as satisfying and you know let them decide whether or not they want to know me but right. i'm just gonna show them who i am and that's all i can do I right. can't control like, anyone's perception, but I can just put my best foot forward and be true to myself and, you know, hope that other people like it. And if they don't, fine. Yeah. But if they do, then I know that they're not, you know, a fan of an artificial persona. They're a fan of me. Sounds like you're good either way. If they like you, that's great. If they don't, that's okay. Isha's going to be Isha. Yeah, you can't win over everybody. Like, you just can't. Right. Um, so why not, you know, win over the people that like you for who you are? <laughs> yeah, finding, finding your own tribe and people who, who resonate with the same, you know, kind of spirit as, as you do. It sounds yeah, like music's yeah. always been a creative outlet for you. Like, can you speak oh, yeah. to that? You know, like you said, there are certain things that you have trouble maybe saying in a conversation, but through a song, you feel more comfortable, you know, sharing yeah. things. Well, because I think, like, you know, you can write something on a piece of paper. You can say something to a person. Um, but I feel like there is nothing in the world that can get you to feel like the mm. way music can because everything from lyrics to arrangement to production, you know, it creates like an experience. Absolutely. Whereas like, when you're just talking to someone, you're not creating an experience. Right. Um, yeah. So, and I think for me, just as a way of like processing things as they happen or as I'm feeling them to me, having like, an entire, you know, guitar track to fit my words or fit my emotions. Like, I just feel like it's such a 3D kind of medium yeah. of getting things across. Um, but yeah, I think like, you know, you can't, music is something that's meant to be felt. And it's hard to tell people about something, okay. but when you, and get them to be on the same page, but when you can get them to feel something about mm -hmm. something, then like, you know, you're so much more in sync. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. It's, it's a really incredible thing. It's yeah. just 
you know, I'm, I'm in awe of it every single day. Another aspect of your, your musical growth is performance. Um, how many shows would you guess, just a little guesstimate, you've played at this point over the... Um, <laughs> I don't know. I really don't know. Definitely over like 80. Over Maybe 80. over 100. Yeah. Just because there was like, there was a point in time where my biggest focus was just kind of creating the foundations of a career in music for myself. Mm -hmm. And to me, what that looked like was just gigging, 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 gigging. Every gig, I would just take it. And I'd be doing like five a week, four a week, wow. four hour shows. Because I would play a lot of farmer's markets initially. And those oh, yeah. are four hour gigs. Um, I saw you at the Sarah one. <laughs> yeah. I was picking and up that, Dale and I saw Isha. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, right on. Perfect soundtrack to your kale shopping. <laughs> getting that chicken, that really good chicken they have at the Saratoga Farmers Market. Oh, Park. yeah. Uh, it always smells so Those delicious. Those potatoes, right? A little mm -hmm. shout out to Saratoga. <laughs> but I think for me, like that felt like something really necessary to kind of hone in on my, you know, performer skills, not right. just like the playing skills, but actually communicating and talking mm. and figuring out, okay, if I say this before a song, how are people going to react? Right. Um, so I took every single gig that I got for a good like year, I think, of just taking everything and not being choosy because I felt like every single performance I could test out a different approach or test out like a different intro to a song. Um, so during that time, I played a ton. And luckily, like, through that, I was also able to make a ton of connections with other artists and other venues and stuff. So eventually it became less of me reaching out, asking people if I could play at their venues or at their shows. And it became a good, like, even balance of getting asked to play and then also doing some, like, you know, networking and reaching out. But... I think through doing that, I was lucky to get to a point, one, where I was earning a good amount of income through those gigs. And I didn't know two, that. Yeah. Like it a, was like. You got a hustle going on. A little. Yeah. Music hustle. Because I would, I would, because it was like my main focus at the time. It was a good yeah. like six months of my life where I took a gap semester from school and said, this is what I want to focus on to see what it's like. And it meant taking a lot of gigs like farmer's markets where you're not necessarily getting paid, but you're getting tipped. Right. Um, or, you know, other gigs that like wine bars where you are getting paid and you're not getting tipped. So it was just kind of navigating. And then of course, like showcases where you're getting a great audience, but you're not necessarily getting paid. Yeah. So it was just a whole range of things. And I think through doing all of those, like I was able to learn okay, in this setting, this is what people like to listen to. Um, so it was just really learning how to like uh, cater to every different kind of situation, which I think is really important because, mm -hmm. you know, it's important to cater to the audience and it's important to know who your audience is. Right. Sounds like you're highly adaptable. And you, I think you have to be at that point. Yeah. But What's your quirkiest performance memory oh man there's been some weird ones um <laughs> <laughs> i remember one of my first like three hour shows was at cafe frascati in downtown san, san oh, yeah. jose i remember that place and i was playing from like 8 p.m to 11 <laughs> and around like 10 30 i think there was a whole bunch of club hopping going on outside. And I think at this point I was maybe like 18, 19. And I was standing there playing my acoustic guitar on stage. And this one lady who is drunk and maybe something else out of her mind just right. stumbles in and like grabs the mic. She's like, let's sing together. You have a great voice. Let's sing. Can we sing like, you know, My Girl by the Temptations? And I was like, okay. Let's go with it. So we just kind of, I don't know if she remembered any of it the next day, but we just kind of busted out in the song. And then, 
you know, she wanted to do another song. So I was strumming the guitar while she was singing and I got a little break and you know, she was having a great time. So it was, it was really funny. And it was kind of awkward when I had to be like, all right, uh, got to cut back in here. Sorry. <laughs> right. How do you do that? It was so awkward. I was like, so, um, thanks. And I just pulled the mic away. But it was really funny and also, like, really necessary for, you know, a solo show for that to happen. Because you learn. Like, right. you learn how to be like, okay, next time if someone asks to sing, maybe don't let them take the mic away. <laughs> So you review the performance in your, your mind, like, this is what I would do different next time. Yeah, like, with each one, I would kind of, on the drive back from the gig, I would kind of, and I still do it. I haven't played a gig in forever because of the circumstance of the world, but right. you always, like, you know, driving back, my I would just walk through, like, everything that happened and be like, okay, that was good. Or when I said that, people really liked it. Or when I did that, people laughed. Um, so it's just kind of like going through and doing an evaluation of the whole mm -hmm. gig and being like, okay, I can take that for next time. Probably drop that next time. I could right. repper this the next time. Um, so it's really fun. Like every single show has been a completely unique experience, which is always so entertaining because you never know what you're going to get. That's what makes it exciting, right? What's your mindset before you take the stage? Like, how, what, are you, what are you thinking? Is there, you know, how do you prepare yourself mentally? Well, I used to have a routine, like a really, really solid routine that I would do before every gig. And it would start, like, as I was driving over, my favorite, like, pre-gig fuel would be peanut butter pretzels. And I'd pop in a couple of those on my way over. For some reason, like, it would smooth my vocal cords over so nicely. Um, and then drink a little bit of water, but never too much. And uh, never drink any, like, super hot things right before I'm going to sing. And then I would just listen to some songs, songs that I knew were in my set. Um, once I started putting my own music out, a really big part of my routine would just be blasting my own songs on the way to a gig and just jamming out in nice. the car. Um, probably not the thing that you want to admit to like tons of people, but no shame. Like it's, it's fun. <laughs> if you don't like your music, who else will, right? Exactly. Um, but I mean, usually there's just so much like excitement to just get out there that, you know, I try not to go through like a long routine anymore because I'm just like, I just want to get out and go. I yeah. just want to start. Like, even if it's starting 10 minutes early, I won't even be able to wait those 10 minutes because I'll be like, I just want to start playing already. Nice. Um, but yeah, if it's like a nerve wracking gig, I played a gig last November in Chicago at the Jeff Buckley um, tribute concert that they have over there at the Uncommon Ground. And I don't usually get nervous before gigs, but I was shaking. Like literally my arms and fingers were trembling. One, because it was cold, but two, because this was like, like the tribute show to one of my all time like biggest influences. And his Amazing. mom was in the audience. Um. Um, and I was singing a song that I wrote for him in honor of him. And then a cover of one of his, songs that he's covered and i was so beyond nervous because i was like this is like this is so emotional like right. everything was just colliding in my head like i'm gonna get to play in front of you know probably one of my biggest inspirations and influences is mom and also like this is an entire show meant to honor him and like what am i doing here i'm from saratoga like what um <laughs> So I was so, so nervous and I just, just got up on stage and I, I felt like on the verge of crying for a couple songs too, just cause it was so emotional that I said, again, really sorry if I break down in tears or I kind of made, lightened it up a bit and said like, you know, I might cry. Nice. Um, this is a very emotional night, but here we go. This one's for Jeff. And I think as soon as I started, like, just completely it went away because that moment and that mood and the setting was so overwhelming and so powerful that 
anything else I was feeling just dissolved. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, that was the amount I was trembling before getting on stage for that. I hadn't done in like years and years and years, but it was nice. It was nice to feel that like energy was still there and it was humbling to be like, okay, good. I'm not completely stone cold. Like I do get nervous. Good. I'm glad. Um, How has playing an instrument impacted your, your confidence? I mean, did you start out this confident person who could do all these shows or was this something that you leveled up through the years? It was definitely, definitely something I leveled up to. I remember like, even if you went back and looked at some of my early, early performances at like the rock shows and stuff, I would be so paralyzed in just standing there playing my instrument, not even looking up, not even moving and just getting it done. And like, I love the performance aspect, but for some reason I just wasn't very comfortable in myself or my own skin or, you know, just there. But I think as, again, going back to, you know, being more me, as I kind of learned to embrace myself more and learned to appreciate like what I could do more and learned to just really forget about what other people were thinking um, while they saw me on stage. Like that was so freeing. And I was able to be like, you know what? I'm not going to wear a sweatshirt. I'm going to wear a leather jacket. And I'm not going to stay in one place. I'm going to grab the mic out of the stand and walk around and like, you know, play with my other musicians on stage. I'm not just going to sing. I'm going to interact with them. Um, And I think through doing that, like I had more fun and you can tell that the audience is having more fun too. Cause they're like, Oh my gosh, did you see what you just did? Like, ah, yes. But it's definitely a process. It's not something that happens like overnight and it's not something that's easy. It's just about putting yourself out there. What's the key to that process? Is it uh, a number of just repetitions getting in front of people or what was the key for you? I think just doing it um, because the more times you do something, the less scary it becomes. Right. Um, And then... I think the fact that so many of those early rehearsals were with other people or not rehearsals, recitals and shows are with other people Mm. um, was always something that I felt super comfortable with. Like I remember that first rock show I did, I was scared out of my mind, but the other person that was playing guitar with me um, on smoke on the water of that yeah. first show. It was one of my bestest friends. Her name's Kanika and her brother was on the drums and we were all going to be on that stage together. And for me, like, yeah, I was scared, but I was like, I'm not, it's not like I'm just going to be standing up there alone. Right. I have my friends up there and we're all going to be scared. Um, so I think just doing it with other people initially is so helpful. Even if it's, you know, playing acoustic guitar and singing while your teacher is sitting right there next to you playing anything. I found that to be super, super helpful. Cause if I did mess up, it's not like, you know, I would just be standing up there alone. There would be something else to, you know, help me recover from that. Um, so I think doing it with other people is super helpful, but then just doing it and doing it and doing it and doing it over and over that's awesome Misha it's really amazing to see how much you've grown in a year I wish I had the confidence you had now maybe I need lessons from you at this point <laughs> you a a podcast. I could never do that <laughs> well see um I get inspired from the students to you, you know you try and teach and then they also offer inspiration back when you see their courage um What's a, an unexpected benefit of playing music that you've gained? I think the community, um, whether it's teachers I've had or whether it's people I've met through performing or people I've met through other industry things, like the number of people you will meet in this industry, because it's so much about meeting people and networking, Like, it's so cool. It's the coolest thing. Like, you can go to a music conference and sit down anywhere, and someone will come and talk to you. Yeah. Whether or not you want them to, they will come and talk to you. (laughs) Right. You know, you'll go and you'll be playing a show, and then you'll just be chilling in the green room, 
And I'm remembering one specific occasion, like I was just hanging out in the green room and talking to another artist and he had just moved from San Francisco. And I was like, hey, right on. I'm like very, you know, I know a lot of people in the San Francisco side of the industry. I'm from San Jose. And he goes, wait, do you know this guy? I was like, of course I know that guy. We played on a show together. Right. Um, so though the industry is huge, it's also very small. And like another, like still that I'm still so blown away by this uh, kind of experience was a producer that I'm working with right now. We were talking and we were working through a song and somehow it came up that, and his name's Anton, the producer's name is Anton. And it came up that he had met Slash. And oh. I was like, excuse me, you met Slash? Oh, yeah. And he goes, yeah, I, you know, I shook my, shook his hand and I said, you know, my name's Anton. And he goes, yeah, Slash. And I was like, how have you not mentioned this before? And he goes, yeah, I mean, I, I played on one of his songs. I played strings on one of his songs. Oh, cool. And I was like, what? well, tell me more. Right. And he goes, yeah, it was this track on his Slash and Friends record. Um, I think the guy from Maroon 5 sang on it. And in my head, I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> is this like, is this, is he talking about one of my all-time favorite songs that has been like, you know, one of the biggest loves of my life since I was in like ninth, 10th grade. And I asked him like, is it, is it the song God In with Adam Levine? And he goes, oh yeah, that's the one. Oh, yeah. and I, uh, Mind blown. I was like, you played strings on my favorite song of all time? But, oh what, my gosh. What? Um, so just things like that. Like it's so crazy how how exciting connected. yeah i was blown away and every time i listen to that song like that's all i can think about i i've worked with the producer that played the strings on that song oh my gosh i hear the strings i know who's playing them like it's so cool and you get so excited when you see like these connections happening or when you see like a friend getting connected with other things in the industry like it's just so so exciting you know you really embody the vision of Musicians Mobile, which is to have it be a musical journey and adventure. I mean, look at all these stories and anecdotes. Can, can you speak to that? Like the music adventure of it all? I think adventure is like the greatest word to describe it because like it's so full of surprises. And I don't think in a million years, looking like ahead when I was nine, starting guitar lessons, looking at where like, I would be now living in London, like what? Meeting these people, knowing these people, like playing gigs all over the world. Like that was not even something I could ever imagine in a thousand, thousand like dreams would ever happen. Um, and even now, like there's still so much more that I want to do and so much more that I want to be that like, I know that, you know, anything is possible. And I know that like, if I just keep, pushing myself with music, you know, there's no limit except myself. And I don't think that like adrenaline or that, you know, lust for challenging myself would have happened if I wasn't in a, you know, an environment like musicians mobile where you are constantly being like exposed to and pushed to do things that are out of your capabilities, but through doing that you grow. And I think that, Talk, that kind of talks on like music as a career, as a journey, and just life in general. Like you don't get anywhere unless you push yourself. And like I found that that really, really rings true for me. What, what advice would you give to new students who are just beginning that adventure and, and how to like maybe think about it so that they embrace it and enjoy it as you have? I think... I would probably say if you're afraid and if you're uncomfortable, you're doing the right thing because like that fear and that discomfort means you're out of your wheelhouse mm -hmm. and it means you're doing something that isn't familiar. And by doing those unfamiliar things, like you're broadening your own abilities as an artist 
as a person, as like just an individual of the world. So like take that fear and don't let it kind of inhibit you. Let it fuel you and just mm. really, really embrace it. Speaking of fuel, what's, what's the driving fuel for you as a songwriter and performer? Um, I don't know. I think just like an undying passion um, and just a constant like craving to learn more. Like, you know, with this coming to London for the songwriting diploma, like I knew I didn't have to do it. And I knew that if I wanted to, like I could probably just write songs by myself, but I felt like I'm not the best songwriter. And I don't know even half the amount of things that I want to know. And if I did learn these things, like this would help me in every different avenue. And it would also boost my courage up as a writer. And it would give me like a structured way of approaching this. Because if I, you know, was on YouTube trying to learn arrangement, I, I don't think I would have like the right discipline I think to keep myself accountable but I just really wanted to learn more and so I think just this constant desire whether it's in the music industry or music business or you know publishing or writing or performing like there's so much I want to learn and even so much I want to listen to so much music that I haven't heard that I want to get exposed to like that just every morning gets me up out of bed and gets me going um yeah (laughs) <laughs> fantastic it sounds like you have a curiosity it it's just constant you just oh yeah going and probably kind of annoying because i do ask a lot of questions but whatever <laughs> yeah. no it's not annoying it's teachers like that it shows that you're <laughs> eager eager to learn what do you want your fans to experience when they hear your music um if they feel understood and if they feel like a song that I've written is something that they can take for themselves and take as their song instead of it being my song, then everything I could have ever, ever wanted to do or achieve has been done. Like to me in my eyes, you know, when I write a song and I work on a song, it's my song. But the minute I put it out, it becomes a song for other people. It becomes their song. And that's why like in the past and even to today, I'm always a little like, you know, hesitant to say exactly what inspired a song or an exact experience that I'm writing about, just because that's my experience that I'm writing about. And I don't want to like pre-prescribe what other people are going to be thinking about when they listen to a song. Makes sense. Like I'll say something vague where it's like, oh, this was a song about supporting one another and being there for someone or, you know, feeling like you're loved or blah, blah, blah. And that's, I'll leave it at that because that's what it is. And then I'll, you know, get it out there and have other people kind of take it and transform it to apply to themselves and their own personal situations. And to me, like hearing what other people kind of take these songs and put meaning into it in their own ways. Like that's so fulfilling and so magical. Incredible. What's, what's your vision for the future? I don't know. I don't know. And I don't I want that. to. <laughs> Cause I think like I'm someone that really likes to plan things out, but I feel like also leaving things up in the air is you know, in terms of big life goals, like I don't want to be like in five years, I'll be here Mm. just because I think having that mindset could potentially cause me to turn things away. That could be amazing. Um, so I don't know where I'll be. Like, I don't know if it'll be performing. I don't know if it'll be working in an industry job. I don't know, but it'll definitely be related to music (laughs) somehow. (laughs) I like that. You're, You're keeping your options open super flexible, open to the moment, collaborating with others. The best things in life happen that way, I think. And it's definitely proven true um, this far. So I figured like, hey, why not try it for another 21 years? (laughs) Yeah, I mean, 
every step leads to the next step. You know, once you get, once you get to next Friday, you're, you're going to know what you need to do Saturday, right? Yeah. And hopefully <laughs> by then, like I'll be able to get out of quarantine here in London. So. Yes. Um, is there any thing we can do to point the fans to your, your site or your music? Uh, go ahead and plug anything that you'd like to right now. Yeah, so I actually just put out a song a little bit less than a month ago. It's a song called Surrender. Um, if you're into the whole rock, alternative rock vibe, I would check it out. Um, it's available on all streaming services. Um, if you like my music and you want to keep in touch with me and my journey and my adventure, you can follow me on social media at E-S-H-A-K Music, Isha K Music. Or you can check out my website, which is www.ishakmusic.com. Yeah, you want to check out Isha's music because every song she's releasing, it seems to keep getting better. And I, I really like this new one. It's It reminded me a little bit of uh, 90s rock, but you doing your own thing. It's it's still modern, but I was like, oh, this is this is refreshing to hear something like this. It's It's different. You're not... You don't seem to be following any trends. My, my wife Sonia and I were going on a, a trip, or we're going out to the Sierras. I was pumping it up. Yeah. Like yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks so much. Yeah, you were following Metallica. It's not a bad company to <laughs> keep. So, some Bay Area legends there, too. Well, thanks, Isha. Best of luck with everything. Stay in touch. Oh, and yeah, I know. I know this is this is gonna be a great experience. You're gonna be collaborating with so many amazing songwriters, and so yeah, awesome. Well, thank you, and thank take care. Thank you so much. You got it. Bye bye. <laughs>